Great, thank you. Um, welcome everyone to Can Canada's Tar Sands Exposed, Exploring the Human and Environmental Costs. My name is Darren Ranko, and I am Chair of Native American Programs here at the University of Maine. This stop on the Tar Sands Exposed tour is sponsored by 350 Maine and Native American Programs with help from 350 Waldo County, the UMaine Green Team, and many generous donors. The entire tour is sponsored by 350 Maine NRDC and 350.org. I want to thank Heidi and Reed Brueger and Bob Klotz as co-founders of 350 Maine. Um, 350 Maine is doing some pretty exciting stuff all around the state and it's having the three of them at the helm of the ship that we owe so much of that credit to. So thank you very much. I also want to, we could list literally dozens of people, but I do want to give a shout out. Uh, we had tremendous help uh, from Jason Linekin and Sass Linekin, if you guys could step up. They did a great job with um, helping us with the web page and the email blast and the messaging that has gone out. Um, there's some artwork, including a banner that you'll see at the end. We're going to do a photograph of the group, and a fellow named Evan Rose uh, did all of that artwork, which has really been very powerful for us. And if you do have photographs that you can push towards us, uh, you can send it to us at 350main at gmail.org, uh, and, and, uh, and we'll make sure that stuff gets up on the web. We won't pay you for it. But Happy to take it from you. This, but um, I also need to give a huge shout out to Bob Shaw and all the work that he's been doing up here at 350 So, um, it's an honor once again uh, to introduce Garth Lenz. Garth is uh, an internationally acclaimed environmental photographer, and I can tell you from riding in the car with him, a complete crazy person. <laughs> uh, but we've had a wonderful time, and uh, you're going to see some pretty disturbing images uh, from his artistry, but uh, he does a great job with presenting it, and we're thrilled to have you here. Thank you, Carter. But um, I just want to thank all of the 350 main folks, all of the, of the groups that have made this possible. Um, it has been so incredibly gratifying to present and meet with all of you and very touching how concerned and committed and dedicated you are to this issue which uh, the origins of which are, are a long way away but I know now for you as so uh, for so many communities it's become a local issue. Um, I get to travel all over the world and see incredibly beautiful things and places and I'm reminded of the fact that this is an issue and a situation. Uh, I believe the tar sands are emblematic of an of a even larger issue, which is our continued uh, addiction and overuse of fossil fuels. We're all in this together. And I'd like to, to make a special mention right at the outset that you know, the people that work in this industry, the oil workers, are, are good folks. They're doing the best that they can to provide for their families. And they're, they're taking incredible health risks too. You'll hear an awful lot from Harold Deranger about the First Nations frontline communities and the health impacts to their communities. Well, the workers face many of these same communities too, uh, same, many of these same health risks as well. Uh, in, a, in a way, they're kind of a frontline community too. And the reason they're suffering the health dangers and, and, and all the risks associated with producing fossil fuels is the fact that every day, in our everyday decisions and how we live our lives, we're creating the market for that product. Now, the boreal forest is the largest, most intact forest ecosystem in the world. Canada's boreal forest is considered the largest, most intact forest. And it stretches all across the north of Canada. I'd like to start at the, the east part of that forest where the forests of, of Labrador and this beautiful primeval landscape meets the Labrador Sea. And in the foreground there you see some antlers of the world's largest remaining wild caribou herd, the George River caribou herd, about 450,000 animals that range across Labrador and Quebec. And all across the boreal forest and we also have this incredible abundance of wetlands. Now globally, wetlands are one of the most threatened ecosystems that we have and yet they're incredibly important. They purify water and air, and they're the northern, the uh, boreal forest and wetlands of uh, northern Canada are also the breeding ground for about half of the 
800 bird species that we find in North America. So bird species from as far as the Gulf of Mexico, like the American white pelican, every year are mi migrating thousands of years, uh, thousands of miles north in the summer to the boreal forest to nest and, and raise their young. Now these forests are also incredibly beautiful. Many, many people in Canada, even you know, people that love nature, they don't realize the, the beauty of these forests. They think that it's sort of this endless carpet of, of black spruce and black flies. And so I always say I do have the, the scars to speak to the black flies and the horse flies and the mosquitoes and the noceums and on and on and on. But it's also an incredibly beautiful landscape. And, and this landscape along the north shore of Lake Superior, these boreal forests, the mo more southerly boreal forests uh, in Ontario, were uh, inspiration for some of Canada's greatest art or greatest non-indigenous art. Uh, that's the art of the group of painters, the group of seven. Now, all across this amazing ecosystem, these forests, incredibly beautiful, subtle, intimate forests. And I, I like to stress uh, some really positive collaborations that have arisen around this, this issue of the boreal forest. And here's an example on the east side of Lake Winnipeg, the Poplar River First Nation. In, invariably, we find that First Nations communities are, 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 are leading the work to protect these remarkable areas, but the Poplar River First Nation got together with Natural Resources Defense Council and other Canadian groups, um, and they're working very, very hard to ensure the protection of this as a UNESCO cultural reserve. When, when we're kids in, uh, in school, we all learn about the, the non-native indigenous or non-indigenous uh, courier de bois, the voyageurs, the Europeans that tried to expand the fur trade looking for a Northwest Passage. And so we learn about these incredible rivers of the boreal, um, the Athabasca, of course, the Peace, uh, the Smoky, the Wapiti, and perhaps the greatest of all, the Mackenzie, which flows all the way north to the Beaufort Sea. So a very important historic link as well for us. Now, to the far north, the boreal forest is met uh, with, the, with the tundra, and this, is, uh, this area is the Tombstone Valley in the Yukon, and it is the wintering ground of the porcupine caribou herd. Now, most of you probably know about the porcupine caribou herd in the context of Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and the work being done there to try to protect it from oil and gas development. Well, this is obviously a, a critical area, the wintering ground, and it too does not have the kind of protection it requires and is also rich in mineral and gas and oil. Now to the west, we have this uh, amazing situation where the largest, most intact forest in the world just over the coast mountains meets the greatest coastal temperate rainforest in the world, the Great Bear Rainforest, which is contiguous with your wonderful example of that ecosystem, the Tongass National Forest. And we'll get to that in a few minutes. Now all across the boreal forest is this amazing, sophisticated, culture of distinct First Nations communities. Now, what is so refreshing in these more remote northern areas which are surrounded by uh, mostly an intact landscape is that many people in these communities still speak the traditional languages, know the dances, know the songs and the games. The culture is alive and in fact thriving. And I think that is uh, to a very significant extent uh, the reflection of a couple of issues. First of all, the communities are further removed from some of our uh, non-indigenous, uh, less positive influences. And they also tend to be surrounded by a landscape which is still mostly intact. When, when I just, I gave a, a talk at Harvard to the Graduate School of Design, uh, the Urban Theory Lab, and you know, they spoke about the connection between social degradation and ecological degradation. Because where you have ecological degradation, you usually have social degradation. And one thing which is incredible, of course, I think, is that right now we're at a period of ecological crisis and we really need to look to the example that these people have followed for 10,000 years. Now, they didn't have to lock up their land in parks and not touch it, you know, keep it as this kind of a museum piece. Um, they used the land. They took everything they needed from the land, but only what they needed, and they used all of it. And I think that's an example that we really need to follow. Um, I had the great pleasure a number of years ago to do an assignment and I was traveling with a, uh, a Dene family 
as they traveled the Liard River as it crisscrosses British Columbia and the Northwest Territories, and they were on their annual, annual autumn moose hunt. And when they finally um, found and killed a moose, they, they used every part of that moose. Every single thing of that moose was used. Um, the intestines could be used to string snowshoes. In fact, parts of the intestines are even consumed. The nose, all of the meat, uh, even, even in the hooves, there's a marrow that they can make a kind of natural jello. I can assure you it's much more healthy and better than the kind of jello you buy in the grocery store. And even the bones within the hooves are fashioned to make a kind of tool that is used to skin future moose that they would hunt. I just think this is a remarkable example of you take only what you need and you use everything that you take and you use it with a, a, a sense of this is what is, is fueling you. Now, in the middle of this incredible ecosystem, we have the antithesis of those values, the Alberta tar sands. The largest energy project, the largest industrial project the world has ever known, quite possibly the most ecologically damaging project the world has ever known, the greatest concentration of capital investment the world has ever known, 200 billion and growing. The third largest proven oil reserves in the world, only Saudi Arabia and Venezuela are greater and the single largest source of foreign oil to the United States. Our Prime Minister, Prime Minister Stephen Harper, said this is an undertaking of epic, uh, uh, of, of, uh, it's an epic undertaking. Now, uh, he said, uh, greater than the building of the Great Wall of China or the pyramids of Egypt. And he's quite right in that. Because what's trapped under the forests and wetlands of northern Alberta is not oil, it's not tar, it's something called bitumen. And bitumen is this tar-like, toffee-like substance, which is very hard to turn into synthetic oil. There are two methods of the extraction, both very destructive. The first method here, these massive, ta um, massive mines. Now, if I were to stand beside that truck, my head would come about midway up that hubcap. That truck is 47 and a half feet long by 32 and a half feet wide by 25 feet tall. Within its dimensions, you can build a 3,000 square foot two-story home. So think not of a truck, but a 3,000 square foot home and line those back and forth across one very small section of six very large mines. And now step back a little further from that mine. And you can see, I'm gonna lose the mic, but you can see here these are trucks. And in the back, those lights, those are also trucks. They're about the size of a pixel. And now imagine lining those up through that picture space and think, would that be perhaps your entire community or maybe a few of your communities? I, I can't say, but I can tell you that is a vast, vast area. Now bear in mind we have six mines like that and we have land leases already approved that will ensure that that footprint increases at least tenfold. Now the other method of extraction is something called in situ or SAG-D, steam activated gravity drainage. And Ariel will we'll talk about this in, in more detail, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. But it's kind of like fracking on steroids. A massive amount of water is piped through pipes deep under the Earth's surface. And what this does is superheated water, chemically laced, uh, liquefies the surrounding bitumen, and then a pipe below pumps it back up to the surface. Now, it, it doesn't look as, as bad as the mines, but it fragments a far greater area, and within that area, there is a 90% reduction of key indicator species like woodland caribou, very important for the First Nations people. And it consumes uh, at least uh, more energy than the mining does to produce a barrel of oil and produces at least as much greenhouse gas. Now, the oil produced by either method is some of the highest carbon content oil in the world. And it is the reason why the Alberta oil sands are Canada's single largest source of greenhouse gases as well as its fastest growing one. The other major issue is water. Between two to four barrels of water are pulled from the Athabasca River to produce each of the 1.8 million barrels of oil that are produced every single day. Now that water is laced with some of the most toxic chemicals known to humanity and dumped into massive tailings ponds that as you can see lie exactly adjacent to the Athabasca River. So selenium, mercury, lead, aromatic hydrocarbons, strychnine, the list goes on and on and on. A toxic cocktail, which is a huge threat to surrounding communities. Because 
we call these things tailings ponds. Well, not too many ponds you can see from outer space, which you can. These, these 19 tailings ponds are the largest toxic impoundments in the world, ranging in size up to 9,000 acres. That's two thirds the size of the entire island of Manhattan. And they are unlined. They are basically, what has happened is they have taken the soil and the trees and the forests and all that re productive organic material that is scraped away to make the mines, and then it's piled up to create these dikes, earthen, earthen dikes up to 300 feet tall. And of course, what's happening is those tailings are leaching out into, into the food chain and into the frontline indigenous communities that surround these areas, and then of course, right in to the foods that they rely on. Now you ask, why, why would these people eat this food, which they do? Well, the reason is that if you walk into the northern store in Fort Chippewan, where everything has to be, uh, has to be flown in, and you look at your price, of, uh, price of, your, of your commodities there, and if you buy the absolute lowest quality food, you know, canned food, white wonder bread, you're going to pay the same price as, it, as, as you would pay for the highest quality organic equivalent of that food in your priciest, you know, fine food emporium boutique. And these are some of the most impoverished communities in Canada, having to purchase some of the most expensive food. So they have no choice but to eat this food. And as a parent of two young, young children who I love and adore, I can't imagine as a parent what that do, does when the only choice you have is feed your kids poisonous food or watch them go malnourished. The fact that this is happening in one of the wealthiest countries in the world is an international scandal. Now all around this ecosystem, the boreal forest is considered to be the greatest terrestrial carbon sink in the world. The boreal forests and wetlands of, British, of, of, of Canada sequester the same amount of carbon as is released every 10 years from the burning of all fossil fuels globally. But what happens is in the creation of the, of the mines, we're stripping away our most, most effective carbon sink and we're replacing it with our most carbon intensive fossil fuel production. And this is why we, you know, we used to be a, a climate change good guy. We were uh, one of the original signatories to the Kyoto Protocol. But now not only have we abandoned that, but we are trying to drag other countries down with them, with us. We have full-time lobbyists in your capital pushing all the time for the Keystone XL pipeline and discouraging any kind of environmental regulation you would seek to bring in to reduce your carbon footprint. Now, 70, 100 miles downstream from, from, from the, the industrial area, we have the Peace Athabasca Delta and the home of the Athabasca Fort Chippewan people whom Ariel represents. This is the largest freshwater delta in the world and the only one that lies at the crossroads of all four migratory bird flyways in North America. As such, it is critical habitat for those almost half of 800 bird species that migrate here every single year to, rest, to, to raise their young. And it's also the last wild refuge for the largest remaining herd of wild wood bison. North America's largest terrestrial mammal. Now it too is being threatened both by the amount of water being pulled from the Athabasca River and then also by the toxic burden of the leaching tailings ponds. And here we have that scene where just over those mountains we go from this dry, relatively small, very beautiful boreal forest and then into this incredibly huge forest of the Great Bear Rainforest where we receive 10 to 20 feet of rain every year. The trees are up to 1,000, 2,000 years old, 40 feet wide, and perhaps as tall as 300 feet. And this is also the home of some of the greatest concentrations of some of the most iconic species that we have in North America. And the salmon are the foundation of this whole ecosystem. The salmon provide all the nutrients for all the creatures there. Of course, the grizzly bears, the wolves, the eagles, um, but also even for the forests. Because as these salmon that are not eaten, because they're so plentiful, but as they, as they decompose and go into the soil, they provide the organic material for some of the richest growing sites. In fact, they have done core sampling of thousand-year-old old trees there, and they find, find salmon isotopes in the trees. So many people call this the salmon forest. And 
what a remarkable example of the way nature uses everything. And I sometimes think when some of the resource extraction companies say, oh, well, we're just taking this away, we're thinning out the forest, we're doing this or that, this ecosystem doesn't need us. It's, it's worked pretty well without us. And of course, you have your Keystone XL pipeline, which seeks to take tar sands oil down to the Gulf of Alaska, not to give you any kind of energy security, but for export, so they can make more money. And in the process, they'd be threatening your agricultural, threatening your agricultural heartland. I kind of jumped around because I'm, I'm having to race because of the time. Um, so actually, what I, I mean to say here, apologies. Um, this is the, the Gateway Pipeline, the Northern Gateway Pipeline, proposed to be uh, brought to you by the same people that brought you the Kalamazoo oil spill, Enbridge. And they want to ask, they want us to believe now that they can build a pipeline across some of the remote wilderness over the northern Rockies, over some of the most productive salmon streams in the world, and there won't be a problem. They want to tell us that there won't be a spill, because if there is a spill, it's going to take out those salmon streams, and it's going to take out all of the species that depend on them. And once that oil reaches Kitimat, if it doesn't spill in the, in the process, it's going to be loaded on tankers about the size of the Empire State Building, they're going to have to navigate one of the most difficult to navigate fjords in the world, Douglas Channel, where a tiny BC ferry sunk and ran aground just a few years ago. Of course, the First Nations people know this. They're a seafaring people. They've lived here for 10,000 years. And they are unanimously opposed to this pipeline because they know it would be the end of their uh, environment, culture, and economy. And of course, as I was saying before, we have the Keystone XL pipeline, a pipeline through your agricultural heartland whose sole purpose is ri rising profits by allowing us to get to more profitable export markets in Asia and Europe. But what's really frightening is this, and this is the infrastructure required to triple expansion over the next 20 years, the result of which will be the industrialization of an area larger than the state of Florida. And James Hansen, who did the math, says that producing that much fossil fuel and releasing it into the atmosphere, as well as taking away some of our greatest carbon sink in the world, means game over for stabilizing climate. And of course, this is why we're trapped in this very difficult situation, because we have created a whole infrastructure created by fossil fuels and for fossil fuels. So even the most ecologically minded of us is, is, has no choice but to contribute to this problem just through our very existence. So what, what do we need to do? Well, it's a big problem, but we have to start. So whatever we can do to make our cities like they are in Europe more encouraging of getting out of our vehicles and finding ways to get around that doesn't consume greenhouse gas. Conserve, conserving, not using the stuff, that is the best solution. And we need to look at some more big picture things. How is the agribusiness uh, structured? How can we do better? How can we get food production and get food to our tables that doesn't incur such a carbon cost? And we no need to look at renewable energy. And I know that wind farms in particular are an issue here, but you know, if you think you would rather be fighting uh, uh, tar sands versus a wind farm, you know, if you think even the worst wind farm development is anything like the tar sands after this, I'm, I'll be very, very surprised. Of course, we don't want bad green energy projects. But please note, this is in Alberta. Alberta is doing some really good stuff too. And this is a wind farm on agricultural land. So it's already an industrialized landscape. But I think we can all agree that we don't need more tar mines. We don't need more pipelines to further tie us to a fossil fuel future. We can't allow the tailings ponds to grow and multiply and continue to threaten some of the most vulnerable populations. And we need to understand that what binds us all, the most important thing we have in this world is water. We're made of water. We're 97% water. The earth is made mostly of water. And water will always be worth more than oil. And we need to protect our friends in our battle against climate change. And that friends, those friends are the wetlands and forests of the world, not just the boreal, but the coastal temperate, the tropical, all the great large tracts of forest are critical. And we need to ensure that our children inherit a future which doesn't look like this. 
because they can't have a future with an environment that looks like this. We want to try and pass this planet on something close to what we received it in. And that's something that looks more like this. And I know that you're all going to join with all of us tirelessly, however you choose to do it, because I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm here to present this, this information as honestly as I can and try to visually give you an idea of the cost of our decisions that we make every day. But I know that you'll do your best to work hard for all of our children's sake to ensure that our world looks more like this. Thank you very much.